Uh, this, uh, this verse here, Psalm 139, verse 14, is a very famous uh, verse. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Well, why did the psalmist David write that verse? Well, we know he was a harp player, and probably a very good one, uh, because Saul, Saul was uh, comforted by the music. So David would have known that he had skill in his fingers to pluck those strings with precision to make music. David was also a shepherd. He knew he had those skills to be steward of creation, to hold the lamb, to move across rough terrain. David was a soldier. He was uh, strong and brave. He had strength in his arms and great skill. So he knew he was fearfully and wonderfully made. That psalm speaks of the miracle of uh, a baby developing in the womb and David himself became a father so he obviously had an interest in that. So for all these reasons we can see why David would say those words, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But actually there's a more important reason than even those reasons. That's the testimony of David. But it's the testimony of scripture. Uh, we can go through the Psalms and see the testimony that man has a creator, that the stars have a creator, creatures have a creator. There are many other examples we could consider in the book of Job and the wisdom literature and indeed throughout scripture. But then it leads to Romans 1, which says there is no excuse for unbelief. Romans 1.20 uh, says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Uh, so we have two testimonies, the testimony of creation. We can see there is a designer creator, but scripture tells us plainly. Uh, we also see in scripture the blindness of man. Again, looking at the psalm, Psalm 14, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. When you uh, consider the words of an atheist scientist, it's not science that has shown there's no God. It's a decision that that scientist has made in his heart to decide that there's no God. In fact, if you look at the history of science, uh, you see uh, Huxley uh, actually said, there's a quotation where he says, modern science must rule out a creator. He never said there is evidence that there's no creator. He said we must decide that there's no creator, which is a really remarkable thing to decide that. And it's really doing what Psalm 14 says, to decide in your heart there is no creator. And in the New Testament, in Romans 1, it speaks of how man exchanges the truth of God for a lie. And many people actually apply that to the theory of evolution. And so we see, particularly in the modern age, the lies of the devil using fake signs to attack the Bible. And I would pick out these five books in particular, if you're interested in this subject. Uh, the most recent by Nathan Lentz in 2018, but going back over the last uh, few decades. These books, it's very, very clear when you read these books, they have an agenda to attack the Bible. They claim they're books of science, but it's so obvious their agenda is to attack the Bible. And in fact, these last two, their agenda is to attack that our verse this evening, Psalm 139, verse 14. They want to attack this idea that the human body is fearfully and wonderfully made. They both focus on the human body and claim that it's a terrible design, 
not a good design. And it's clear they hate scripture. So we see the lies of the devil today. Just to give you... Oh, sorry. I need to press this button. Yeah. So just to give you an example. Uh, this is Richard Dawkins. Uh, book. If you were to read this book, I'll just show you a couple of quotations. The eye is not just a bad design, it's the design of a complete idiot. Uh, Richard Dawkins is not an expert in optics or that part of human anatomy, but he is very boldly giving... And then on another page he says, the innards of large animals, including humans, are a shambles. If you look at the intestines, the heart, the lungs... and uh, particularly chapter 11 is a monologue of claiming the human body is badly designed. This book has sold millions of copies, translated into many languages. This is what uh, the public are hearing today and students in university. This is the most recent book, uh, Human Errors by Nathan Lent. And in his book, he, he's from City University in New York. He says the ankle contains seven bones, most of them pointless. And the wrist has eight bones like a useless pile of rocks. And uh, the whole book goes on to attack the idea that humans are well made. He lectures in genetics, not in biomechanics. So 99% of the book is on areas he's not an expert. Uh, in. Just to mention, there is a correct scientific view, and even today you can see secular scientists putting forward the correct scientific view, contradicting those previous people. But a, a lot of people are not aware that those evolutionary philosophical scientists are saying things that are actually scientifically incorrect. I'll just give you some quotations. I mean, these are classical ones. Leonardo da Vinci famously said the foot is a masterpiece of engineering, the complete opposite of what some of these popular scientists are saying today. Isaac Newton said the thumb alone would convince me of a creator. And th this is my own uh, area, biomechanics. And I could show you lots of many quotations in the modern book. Uh, this is from 2020. Many structures in the ankle work in perfect synchronization. If you read the testimony of scientists who work in the areas of biomechanics, like the foot and the hand, almost always you will hear great praise for the design of the hand, the ankle, the, the wrist, the foot. In fact, the whole of the human body, if you actually speak to an expert in those areas, they will say it's wonderfully designed. So there is this contradiction between these philosophers of evolution who claim they're speaking science and true science. So I will uh, very briefly go through three areas. One is one of the hands, uh, one of the feet, and thirdly, the nervous system. Uh, a couple of years ago I had a, a, a one-year fellowship at Cambridge University to study the hands and the feet and one of the reasons I went was to check up on those previous quotations of those evolutionary philosophers. Um, so evidence of design in the human hand. The human hand has incredible agility. Musicians like pianists, some can play up to 20 notes a second, and not just 20 notes per second, but with precision and feeling, accuracy. Uh, this pianist, at the age of 67, can still play at 20 notes per second. One of the reasons for the skill of our hands is that we have what's called very small motor units. Muscles are made up of individual units, and in the case of the hands, those individual units are very tiny uh, muscle fibres, and it gives great precision and control. You can have a very delicate pinch with your fingers, you can hold a grain of sand very delicately, but 
there's also great strength, uh, a great range of force you can make in your, uh, in your hand. There's also, in, uh, well, there are many ways you can show the agility of human hands. Uh, one of the ones I like is uh, the ability to do stitching. Uh, to do, apparently, to make one stitch requires eight steps. And there are competitions about how many stitches you can make in one minute. I think I would struggle to make one myself. But the world record is held by a Dutch lady who can do 118 stitches in one minute. If you multiply that by eight, that's how many movements she's doing in 60 seconds. Evolutionists have a problem here because according to the theory of evolution, the whole of the human body should only be evolved enough to survive and nothing more. It's the whole definition of evolution. Nothing beyond hunter, gathering, reproduction, and therefore the ability to play the piano, musical instruments, knitting, is a real mystery for the evolutionists. And I've, I could give you various quotations where they marvel that our brain is over-designed, our hands are over-designed, which of course is exactly what you'd expect if God had created man. Well, it turns out our hands are a miracle of design. Uh, I've tried to produce prosthetics myself for feet and hands and knees, and I've looked at the prosthetics of my colleagues, and engineers struggle to produce anything approaching the functionality of the actual human hand. We have these uh, precision bones and ligaments, muscles and tendons which engineers cannot replicate uh, the efficiency and precision of those tendons and then blood supply and nerves. It's an astounding integration of uh, an incredible assembly. In your wrist you have eight bones. They're in two rows. Uh, they're shown in green and red. Four wrist bones on the top four wrist bones on the bottom. On the left, there's one wrist bone on top of the other. Your wrist allows you to flex and extend if you're playing the piano or doing other things. And there are a couple of very specialised features. It's a double joint because you have two rows of bones. You have a double joint that gives you a big range of motion. But there's a piece of precision engineering because the two joints produce what's called a concentric bearing. Because of the radius of this bone and the radius of that bone, they are in just the right proportion to give a common centre of rotation. If it wasn't that way, your wrist would flop all over the place, but it looks as though, it feels as though you have one joint, even though you have two. But the reason it feels like one is because of this precision concentric bearing. But our wrists are very special because as well as doing uh, the flexion extension, we can also do adduction and abduction, which means your wrist forms a biaxial bearing. It's a bearing in one direction, a bearing in the other direction. Engineers know that it's extremely difficult. What's amazing about the wrist joint is you get another double bearing, even in this direction, to give large amounts of abduction, adduction. And just like flexion, it's a concentric bearing, once again. So you see these precision details in two different planes. Engineers simply cannot reproduce <coughs> that precision engineering. On top of that, the wrist is very strong. Uh, the, these bones form an arch. Arch is a very strong, like a Roman arch, but not only does it form a strong arch, but you have this ideal load path through the fingers of compression load. So not only do you get an arch, but it lines up with each finger. The little finger and one next to it are not, don't take a big load, so you can get away with one. But a structural engineer looks at this and sees completely an optimal design.
Uh, when you think of how delicate our hands are, it's remarkable how strong uh, they are at the same time. A lovely feature of the hand is that as well as forming arches in the plane of the hand, like this, if you look in the cross-section of the hand, they form another arch. So there are arches in two different directions. And in this direction, it forms a protective tunnel because the muscles of that of the hand are actually in the arm. Most of the, of the action you do is in your arm. If you do this, you feel your muscles working. Now, because of that, very delicate tendons, blood vessels and nerves, have to make it to the hand. The reason we don't keep breaking, uh, disrupting them, is because we have this powerful tunnel. It's just a fantastic design, a multifunctioning wrist with arches in different directions the most brilliant design but then we come to the finger uh, design and I've produced I've tried to produce robotic fingers myself uh, and I just I'm astounded at the design of the human hand because when you uh, contract your muscle in your arm, this is what happens. You have a tendon, which is the red part, and that's what happens. So you pull that tendon and it comes up. That tendon goes through little tunnels with synovial fluid, so it has guides, and it's a precision movement. Uh, it's very delicate, as I know when I chop my thumb, because uh, I broke a tendon and I, I had uh, last week I had surgery at the Royal United Hospital and they sewed it back together. So uh, recently I'm very much appreciating the function of these tendons. But then you have a tendon on the, on the other side. So you have a set of tendons here and a set of tendons here. In fact, on this side I think there are two sets. So this is the palm of the hand. And this time when you contract you pull the finger down. So this is, this is the flexion. The previous one was extension, but this one is uh, flexion. Now, these work with just mind-boggling precision. Pianists can play for hours with precision because those tendons work with precision. Engineers cannot get anywhere close to what we see in the human body. Uh, engineers can't produce the bearings, the synovial fluid, the elastohydrodynamic lubrication, which is in the joint. There are so many things engineers just cannot copy. It's just too difficult. The design is so brilliant. But the next slide... OK, this is a movement that engineers would normally say is just impossible. Because if you press, uh, say, a key on your mobile phone or computer, this is the movement you're making like that. Okay, now this should be mechanically impossible and I'll try and explain why. It should be impossible because you have a combination of extension and flexion. You're combining extension and flexion. Now the reason that should not be possible is if you extend, you do that, uh, if you flex, you do that. But how can you possibly mix those two? Because either you're flexing or extending. How, it, it must be impossible. I'll show you one of the ways it happens. And this is really mind-boggling. If you want to do a pressing action, your brain says to a very special muscle to pull the tendon sideways. So the tendon, it does your flexing extension. It pulls it sideways and it pulls it over the centre of rotation of that joint. When it pulls over the centre of rotation of that joint, it means it's extending and flexing at different joints. And then you can extend and flex. So the tendon, instead of being on one side of the joint, it actually 
deviates on one joint, so it's on both sides of the joint. It's if you suggested that in the design of a robot, your 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 systems manager would say, oh, no, that, that's that's impossible. How could you possibly do that? And yet, this little muscle can play tricks on that tendon and on centers of rotation. And when you do this, you're not even thinking about it. Your brain just you're already moving different muscles, but it then says, well, there's this tiny muscle around here that's going to just pull this tendon in a certain direction to come over that centre. And you can do it in a split second without even thinking. It's an outrageously brilliant design. Well, that was very brief on the hand. Then we come to the foot. But if I can... Just make a comment. I mentioned earlier that Nathan Lentz, who's a, a lecturer now at New York City University, he claims the wrist is a rubbish design, the wrist bones are a useless pile of rocks. He hasn't studied the wrist. He hasn't studied the precision bearings, the biaxial bearing, the concentric bearing. What you often find with these, with these popularizers of evolution is they have never studied something and you, you might say, well, well, why would they make these incredibly <coughs> erroneous statements that the wrist is a useless pile of rocks? Why, why would they do that? They do it because evolution predicts that the human body should have a rubbish design. Evolution predicts the world should have a rubbish design. Evolution is limited to step-by-step -step change. Intelligent designers are not limited. My students are not limited. And God certainly isn't limited to step-by-step -step change. So evolution predicts the natural world, biology, should be a rubbish design. And therefore, Richard Dawkins, Nathan Lentz, Abby Hafer, Jerry Coyne, the others, because evolution tells them the human body should be rubbish, they then say it is rubbish. Because if evolution is true, then we must have a rubbish design. That's their logic. Uh, they think they don't need to look at evidence because they assume evolution is true and then we must have a rubbish design. The foot is an amazing piece of engineering and unique. Apes don't have an arched foot. Uh, apes effectively have four arms, four hands, for, which is a very good design for climbing in trees. But we have an arched foot, unique in creation. It has to be very strong because uh, the whole weight of the body goes through our foot. If you're a large male and you jump really vigorously, you can have a force of one ton going through your Achilles tendon. So the foot has to take tremendous uh, loads. And the foot, the very compact, multifunctioning device, the foot has to be a very stiff lever uh, when you run. Uh, the opposite to an ape, the human foot becomes very, very stiff to transmit that, if you're a large male, one ton force uh, to sprint, to jump. But secondly, the foot has to be flexible. Look at the flexibility of that tennis player's feet. Now, an engineer will tell you strength and flexibility are the opposite things. How do you, how can you how can you make something super strong to take a ton of force? And then it's got to be flexible. I mean, that, that's just impossible. The foot does it with the most amazing uh, placement of stiffness just in the right places. And the muscles can also stiffen up the foot. So it can be both things. But then it also has to pronate and has to be very strong. And it even has to give balance. Our feet have three-point contact easy for us to stand on one leg because you just put the centre of gravity through those three points. Now if I give that to my undergraduate student and say, well, produce a design that does all that, they just say, well, that's impossible. Three-point contact and flexibility and stiffness and pronation and strength. It's just impossible. And engineers have tried to produce prosthetic feet and robotic feet and replacement joints and they failed. Uh, they can't 
they can't get this functionality into a prosthetic or a robotic foot. Even replacement joints at the moment are not, are not successful for ankles. Uh, hips and knees are very good, but ankles are extremely hard to replace. So I mentioned uh, the force can be one ton in a large male in that Achilles tendon. Well, this is the anatomy of a foot. You have the hind, you have the hind foot, the midfoot, and the forefoot. I've done research on the hind foot and the midfoot. And if you read Nathan Mertz's books, he refers to the midfoot and says, those five bones are useless. You'd be better off just having a solid bone at the midfoot. It would be much better if you just got rid of that midfoot and fused it all together. I'll come back to that. Uh, later. So what you have in the foot, in a way similar to the hand, you have three multifunctioning arches. This is the genius design in the human foot. So your first three toes, big toe and the next two toes, form what's called the medial arch, which is a very stiff arch. One of the most unique parts of the human body is the big toe. Uh, apes have a flexible thumb pointing sideways, but we have a strong big toe pointing forwards. When you run, you push off your big toe. Uh, but it's the first three toes that form the medial arch, a very stiff lever. But then we have a lateral arch. When you run, you uh, naturally, you land on the outside of your foot, which is a flatter arch, a very flexible arch, formed by your first two toes. So you, have, you mainly have flexibility in your small, smallest two toes, mainly have stiffness in your big three toes, but actually even the medial arch has a degree of give and stiffness. It even has what's called a spring ligament for storing energy and releasing it. But then you have a transverse arch uh, connecting those two arches and uh, perform very special functions it has flexibility for shock absorption. It's even been found recently that that arch uh, helps to stiffen the medial arch. If you have a, a beam, even a piece of card, if it's flat, it's, it's quite flexible, but as soon as you put a curve in this direction, it becomes very stiff in that direction. And it's been shown that the transverse arch uh, does that. So you have this multifunctioning design each arch complementing the other arch and on top of everything else it produces three-point contact because the medial and lateral arch produce a point of contact at the end so it's mind-boggling how many functions you pack into this extremely clever design those bones held together by something like a hundred ligaments uh, it's just an astonishing design then you have a heel pronation, which again acts as a kind of shock absorption. You don't want too much, but you don't want too little. Uh, it helps uh, give you a break the load when you land. You may not know this, but you have a fibula, the small bone in your lower leg plays an essential role in the stability of your ankle joint your, and your foot. So when you pronate, you're stabilised by a linkage mechanism, uh, the fibula. In the book by Nathan Mentz, he says, oh, I think the fibula is a useless bone. We'd be better off without it. And he hasn't read a long list of scientific papers that says the fibula is absolutely essential to the stability of the foot and the ankle. The errors he makes in his book are quite breathtaking. And yet it is publicised as scientific scientifically valid arguments. Sadly, it's convincing people that the theory of evolution is true and that we are not fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay, but I, I do want to have a couple of slides tackling two of the claims of Nathan Lentz. Uh, th this is, that's the most recent book, out in 2018. So he says, uh, the ankle would function better with a due structure and he's particularly talking of the midfoot foot. 
you know, he's saying he, even those seven bones, you know, we'd, we'd be better off having it all fused. It's completely unaware that you need flexibility that comes through those bones. I could quote you a hundred scientific papers talking of the importance of having those bones. I'll just give you two quotations. Uh, this is from a hospital in Birmingham. Walking on rough ground is difficult after a fusion. Most people cannot play vigorous sports such as squash after a fusion. If you have very bad arthritis, you might be better off with a fused ankle. But if you have a fused ankle, the doctors will warn you um, that you, you have less functionality. And, it, and here's another medical quotation. If you have a fused joint, the joints either side become overstressed. So... You, if you can get away with it, never fuse your midfoot or your hindfoot. And all through the book, he's contradicting true science. Uh, but he's so obsessed with this idea that evolution is true and evolution produces a terrible design, and then he just assigns terrible design to the whole human body. And it would be a joke if it weren't for the fact that his books are being promoted to students and children in schools. And he's only copying what Richard Dawkins uh, has done. This is an objection someone might say to you, so it's worth me uh, covering this one. Lentz says, you know, the ankle joints should do nothing but malfunction. And he quotes all his friends who've had bad ankles and he's had a bad ankle. And, you know, if you watch the Olympics, the run at these athletes, they, they pull a muscle and they pull a joint. But there are scientific papers that have actually studied this. This particular paper, I think, looked at hundreds of athletes. And the conclusion was, uh, if you're an athlete, you will rarely get an ankle sprain. It will be so rare. It just won't happen unless you do something stupid. And if you do something stupid, then yes, you will get an ankle sprain. But if you don't, if you look after your ankles, they will rarely go wrong. Um, I've been running all my life. Most days, uh, I run at least five miles before breakfast. And I've never had a problem with my ankles. Um, I've I haven't overtrained. I haven't done silly things with my ankle, and my ankles have been fine. Uh, of course, you look at Olympic athletes, they will deliberately take risks. The rewards of winning a gold medal or a race are so great, they deliberately push themselves to the limit. You could look at a Formula One car and say, look, the tyres last half an hour, the car breaks down after one race. So is it a bad design? No, it's not a bad design. It's designed by the top automotive engineers, but it's deliberately pushed to the limit, like the Olympic athlete. And what Lentz doesn't do, he doesn't differentiate between different causes of failure. And had he have done that, he would have realised that the ankle joint is remarkably robust. It rarely goes wrong if it's looked after. But then thirdly, evidence of design in the nervous system. Uh, one of the remarkable things about uh, humans and, and sometimes animals, but particularly humans, is hand-eye coordination. If you watch a top tennis player, they will run to intercept a tennis ball going almost 100 miles an hour. They will hit it in a split second with such precision they can hit it to a pinpoint accuracy on the other side of the court. The hand-eye coordination is just astonishing. The human body has 150,000 kilometres of wiring if you add up all the nerves. A spacecraft has only 30 kilometres. Um, there's just no comparing human design systems with the human body. Uh, an engineer can't comprehend 150,000 kilometres of wiring, wiring going to every single corner of the human body.
we have what's called a motor cortex, the part of the brain that deals with controlling muscles. We have a sensory cortex, another part of the brain, receiving signals from sensors around the body. You have millions of sensor pathways going up, half a million motor pathways coming down. In a cord of about 12 millimetres diameter, that is just way beyond anything engineers can do in a cable of that size. But what is just a complete miracle, these come from one place, that comes from another place. When it goes down the spinal cord, it all gets mixed in going to exactly the right place in every part of the body. So muscles have sensors and uh, motor signals, and they all end up getting to the absolutely the right place. It's the most incredible wiring system. So there are 700 muscles in the human uh, body. When engineers produce a robot, they never get that kind of number. They, they have less than a tenth of that number of actuators. But this is the really special thing. We have 500,000 motor units. Why is that important? It's important for this reason. Um, if I'm holding a glass or holding something really heavy or really light, I can adjust my force. The reason I can adjust my force is that in my biceps, I will probably have over 100 units. So I can just command one of those units, I 100th of my biceps, or I could command all of them and anything between one and a hundred. And it's even more clever than that because of those hundred motor units, they always vary in size from tiny ones to bigger ones. And your brain knows which is the tiny one. So you can have a very, very delicate force because your brain knows what is the tiny motor unit. The next picture is one of my favorites. That is the iris. Now, normally, when you look at someone's iris, you're, you're thinking, well, this person's got blue eyes. But the next time you look at an iris, think you're looking at hundreds of individual muscles. What you're looking at there are muscles. And all those motor units and their tiny motor units <coughs> in the eye have a nerve. So in your eye, you have muscles, nerves. So you're looking here at hundreds of muscles. Notice on the inside, this is one set of muscles, and on the outside, you have another set of muscles. The one on the inside closes the lens. The ones on the outside open it. It's just like a lens, except it's 10,000 times more accurate and more compact than an engineered lens. And this is just one tiny detail of the human body. This is part of the eye, which Richard Dawkins says is so bad, it's like the design of a complete idiot. <coughs> then our bodies are packed with sensors. We have uh, 50,000 proprioceptors. Uh, they, are, they are sensors in our joints. Uh, if you close your eyes, you can know quite accurately where your joints are because you have a sensor which tells you not just the position but even the rate of movement of your joint very important in movement uh, so that sorry they are the 50,000 proprioceptors we also have uh, 5 billion hair follicles on the adult human body and millions of skin sensors packed into the skin And let me just tell you what happens. When a fly lands on your arm, say your arm's out of view, you're not looking at it. If a fly lands on your arm, normally you'll know about it because your brain's receiving millions of pieces of information every second. The brain has this ability to instantly look at that million pieces of information and say, I think, this person needs to know this one bit of information. So when a, a fly lands on your, your skin, your brain says, OK, I've got a million bits of information. A fly has just landed. So I'll tell the brain that. So you, you then know a fly has just landed. 
It then tells you where it's landed because the nerve winds all the way up to the brain, it says it's on the upper part of your arm. Maybe you want to have a look at that fly, see if it's biting you or something. A fly weighs a fraction of a gram. How could you possibly detect a tiny, tiny fly landing on your arm? Well, this is, this is what happens. The fly is touching some of these hairs. You see there's a hair here. Notice at the bottom of the hair, there are nerve windings around that hair. When the hair bends, the nerves at the bottom of the hair detect the hair is bending and then the nerve signal goes all the way up to the brain. And the brain says, I think there's a, a fly over there. Detecting a force so tiny, um, engineers would struggle to measure that uh, force. And then, of course, the humans have these great brains. Um, you might have seen Alice Roberts on the television. Uh, she's a professor of the public understanding of science. She's also been the president of the British Humanist Society. She's written uh, books promoting atheism. She uses her BBC position to promote atheism. She is quoted on the brain as saying the brain is a mystery because it's far more powerful than it needs to be and it's really puzzled us. But of course, uh, as Christians, we know that uh, the brain is far more than it needs to be just to survive. God has deliberately given man that great creative capacity because we're made in the image of God and we're to be stewards of creation. In your brain you have trillions of connections. You have a billion connections in one cubic millimetre. The storage capacity of your brain is a million gigabytes. At home you probably have a five gigabyte memory stick uh, with the storage capacity of the brain is a million gigabytes and we have a hundred thousand miles of blood vessels to cool the brain. The human brain is better than a supercomputer. We can do a billion calculations in one billion of a second. The human brain requires 20 watts of power. A supercomputer requires 20 megawatts of power, a million times more and even then it cannot keep up with the human brain and the human brain can do so many things including appreciate uh, beauty so let me make a few conclusions there are two world views that, uh, one of the things that is so clear in modern times is that there are two world views christians can see that one of the sad things about modern society is that the Richard Dawkins of this world, Nathan Lentz of this world, Alice Roberts, they will not admit that there are two worldviews. Alice Roberts just says she's right and everyone else is wrong. There aren't two worldviews. There's only one, and her worldview is the only worldview we've come from apes. Uh, that's it. But the fact is, there are two worldviews. The biblical worldview, uh, reading from Psalm 8, you have made Man a little lower than the angels, you have crowned him with glory and honour. The high view of man. Now I'll tell you the evolutionary worldview of man. This is from Peter Atkins, the professor who was at uh, Oxford. Right. We are just a bit of slime on a planet. That is the evolutionary world view. That's what students are taught. No wonder we have this problem with uh, mental health today. How different those two worldviews are. And the world needs to hear the gospel message. Uh, the, the lie of the devil, the evolutionary worldview. Uh, people need to be uh, told the revelation of scripture and this far better worldview. What we see today so clearly is men suppressing the truth. Ironically, uh, many Creationists, intelligent design people are accused of suppressing scientific truth when the, the reality is the complete opposite. We see so many today suppressing the truth. And I, I might have said this before here, 
my testimony, having spent 30 years in academia, uh, Bristol University and Cambridge University, I'm so surprised how many academics are sympathetic to intelligent design. I would say the majority of academics are agnostic and maybe the majority are, are really sympathetic to intelligent design, but there is this hard core of atheist scientists who frankly do bullying, they will not allow intelligent design. The agnostic scientists, their sin is laziness, not wanting to get engaged in the debate. And so that minority of atheists are ruling uh, the day in academia. They are suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. So in conclusion, the wonder of man, uh, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, designed for more than survival. One of the things you can, if you look carefully at the educational system, it, it is based on this atheistic philosophy. We're just here to survive. We're just here for pleasure. Eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow. We die. But the great, the wonderful aspect of the gospel message is that we are made in the image of God. Um, and it's no surprising, it's not surprising if you look back in past centuries, the golden age of music, art, science, it's not surprising that uh, the effect of that more positive view, that higher view of man, it then has an effect on society. And sadly today we see the chaos in society that we have, in the education system and in politics and the whole of society. So this isn't just an individual thing, it starts to have an effect on the culture of the whole uh, country. Hopefully that will be encouraging to you, but uh, let us pray that uh, the eyes of the world, the people in Bath, uh, would be open to not just the revelation of creation, but the revelation of scripture telling us that there is a creator, someone to whom we are accountable to, and man's biggest need is to repent of his sin and to believe and trust in his creator through the only saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we can uh, have the same understanding as the psalmist David to know that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And the psalm goes on to talk about the closeness of God uh, holding him by the hand. If we do know God through the Lord Jesus Christ, then we can have that very close relationship and know the help that comes through knowing God. Thank you. God bless. Just uh, before we close, if anybody has any Sorry. questions, Stuart's happy to take one or two questions. Uh, yes, sorry. With um, modern simulation and mobile simulation, particularly with that chat lens, you get how if you feed those five phones in the, in the middle of the ankle, you have reduced agility in the ankle. If someone mocked it up in simulation and proved the point and, and showed things back to the world? Uh, yeah, that could be quite helpful to do. As you say, it is possible to do those simulations. I have... Uh, produced uh, a more technical, longer talk for the Discovery Institute in the United States. Um, that's been published in the United States, and I think a few people have sent a link to Nathan Lentz. So, um, and he's been given other links. Um, he knows, and probably sent some of his students as well. So, yeah, the arguments are going backwards and forwards. What we're noticing in recent years is that um, people like Richard Dawkins won't now refuse to debate with anyone who believes in intelligent design, uh, so they do not like debating. It's just dismissive. Um, but it's a good point. Yeah, could try that. The third question was, or it was related, but I wonder whether Nathan Lance was actually going to line up for an operation on his... <laughs> that would be a very good challenge. Yeah. Um, if we could, yeah, get some money and say, okay, we'll pay for your thing to be fused, yeah, be free of charge. Yeah, yeah. 
and then I'll play you a squash. <laughs> Um, for links, I'll think about that, but uh, yeah, the back is an S shape for humans. Um, an S is a very good suspension shape because if it was dead straight, it would, you'd have shock loads through compression. The S gives you that uh, soft softness. Um, the vertebrae also have like a cup stacking system, remarkably uh, flexible. It's like the foot, you have both great strength and flexibility at the same time. One thing I would say, if you look up Southampton University uh, research into uh, bio-inspired bridges using the human back, they had a million pound grant from the government, the EPSRC, uh, a million pound grant just to apply the design lessons from the human back, to apply them to bridges, to make better bridges, because Engineers would love to produce bridges that didn't wear out, but had this flexibility and strength. And they've been copying the human back because engineers see creation as the gold standard of design, including the human back. Um, it's a similar story to the ankle. Uh, if you misuse your back, and it's very easy to lift something in the wrong way, and your back can be done in. Um, but people who look after their back, it's remarkable how long the back will last. And if you don't have arthritis, I could also mention, you know, because of the effect of the fall, the sin of Adam, we, there is arthritis, things do decay. But when you're dealing with a young, healthy body, you rarely get a problem with the human back unless you do something silly, which is why at Southampton University, they have this big project. Uh, the back is a brilliant design. If you look on CMI, Creation Ministries International, they're the best website for these specific questions and they will almost certainly go into detail on that with references, but engineers completely admire the, the design of the human back. 